Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Tony Rothschild. I'm the chair of the Grand Rounds Committee. A couple of announcements. Um, in order to receive uh, credit for attending today's um, Grand Rounds, you need to fill out the Survey Monkey um, that came with the Grand Rounds announcement on Monday uh, from Karen Lambert. Grand Rounds will continue to be on Zoom for the rest of 2021 and at least until March of 2022. Uh, because um, today's speaker had an emergency that he had to attend to, um, he recorded the uh, lecture on a video, which we will play. If you have questions for the speaker, unlike what we usually do is to type them in the chat function, Dr. McAvoy said that you could email him. And I imagine he provides his email at the end of the lecture. If he doesn't, um, if you could want to contact me, I'll get you his email. Next, there's no grand rounds for the next two weeks, no grand rounds on December 23rd and December 30th. So the next grand rounds will be um, on the uh, first Thursday in uh, January, which is January um, Six, and it will be given by Dr. Julia Koretsky. The title of Dr. Koretsky's talk is Approaches to Management of Treatment-Resistant Psychotic Depression. Dr. Koretsky has recently written a chapter on this topic that is coming out in Bobo and colleagues' book. Uh, it's coming out in January on managing treatment-resistant resistant depression in general. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Shadu Fan. Dr. Fan is professor of psychiatry and director of the UMass Psychotic Disorders Program, and he will introduce today's speaker. Okay, thank you, Tony. <clears throat> so today's speaker is Dr. Joseph uh, Mc McAvoy. Dr. McAvoy is a um, case distinguished professor of psychiatry at the Augusta University Health in Augusta, Georgia. After receiving his medical degree from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, Dr. McAvoy uh, completed two years of training in internal medicine at the University of Utah hospitals, and then completed his uh, psychiatry residency at Vanderbilt. He has served on the faculty at Vanderbilt, uh, the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, since 1989 uh, at Duke University. Dr. McBoy's research and clinical work have focused on severe and persistent mental disorders such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and bipolar disorder. Dr. McAvoy served as a co-principal investigator and the project medical officer for the KD schizophrenia trials, which are uh, milestone trials uh, in the field, and for several subsequent uh, trials funded through the NIMH-funded uh, schizophrenia trials network, as well as for the industry-funded uh, um, uh, comparison of a typical for first episode or CAFE trial. Uh, he is currently the principal investigator for the NIMH funded uh, trial to compare uh, long acting injected medications for schizophrenia. He is uh, an author uh, on more than 150 referred uh, publications and uh, numerous uh, invited publications, including books and book chapters. Dr. McAvoy edited the expert consensus guidelines for the treatment of schizophrenia in 1996 and 1999. Dr. McAvoy is um, part of our ongoing uh, clinical trial using brexpibazole in patients with schizophrenia and uh, uh, co-occurring substance use disorder. Uh, this is a multi-center uh, trial um, led by UMass and uh, participated by uh, Mass General Hospital University of North Carolina and uh, University of Augusta. Uh, uh, Dr. McAvoy uh, will give uh, for today's grand round talk. Uh, the title uh, for Dr. McAvoy's um, talk is uh, The Treatment and Managing, Management of Schizophrenia. Hi, I'm Dr. Joe McAvoy. I'm at the Medical College of Georgia. Uh, we'll be speaking uh, uh, today about the treatment and management of schizophrenia. 
I do want to point out that in person, I'm much better looking and have thick wavy hair. Oh, I, I, my potential conflicts of interest are uh, restricted to research grants we have from uh, several pharmaceutical agencies uh, mentioned there uh, to do clinical trials. So what I'm going to uh, suggest is a somewhat different view, uh, way, way of organizing, formulating, structuring uh, the understanding of schizophrenia from that of DSM, uh, which focuses on the psychosis aspect of it and then notes that uh, there are these enduring deficits as well. I want to point out that uh, I think these deficits uh, are present way earlier than psychosis appears, uh, not only affect people who get the psychosis, but a substantial number of their first degree relatives, uh, and that are very determinant of the outcome in terms of occupational and social functioning. Uh, and that, if anything, the psychosis uh, is an epiphenomenon, uh, uh, probably resulting from the same primary pathophysiology that we don't really understand that affects distributed circuits in the brain that manage important things. Uh, so uh, let's go through these overview points. The, the primary pathophysiology of schizophrenia, uh, I will propose involves widespread disruption of cortical circuitry, perhaps you know, in some cases this may be from excessive pruning, but there are probably other ways it's done as well. This results in deficits uh, enduring deficits that don't go away and that we have no treatments for in cognitive functioning, in motivation and expression, and in uh, sensory motor activity. Uh, and we refer to the, the, the last of these as neurological soft signs and the second of these as negative psychopathology. They are de uh, demonstrable in, in, in neonates, infants, and uh, progress through development uh, accelerate a bit in adolescence and uh, early 20s uh, uh, le leading up to uh, the transition in, into psychosis to those uh, individuals most significantly affected and then remain in most patients relatively stable although in some patients they, they, they seem to uh, uh, progress. As I mentioned, 30 to 40 percent of the first degree relatives of patients with schizophrenia uh, may demonstrate these de uh, deficits. Again, in particular, if you're looking at a clearly familial uh, group of uh, individuals with, with uh, schizophrenia. As I mentioned, these deficits do not respond to treatment with antipsychotic medications, and we have to conceptualize them along the lines of how we conceptualize developmental disability, traumatic brain injury, stroke, where you know, brain volume and the associated function has been lost. Uh, <clears throat> pills don't make it grow back. Uh, and we have to modify our expectations as to these people's function uh, downward. We have to try to identify what, what strengths they have remaining and focus on those, a system with those accommodate our activities and the environment uh, the best we can uh, to get to allow best function. And I, I, I bring up this concept of prostheses. We all know about physical prostheses, an artificial leg to replace a leg that has been lost uh, due to injury or illness. Uh, but I'm talking about uh, uh, mental and psychosocial prostheses. Now, this, what I'm going to call the secondary pathophysiology of schizophrenia is all about loss of control of dopamine neurons and uh, especially the tracks that ramify through the limbic system and striatal areas that, that have to do with association of, 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 of information and assignment of, uh, of valence, importance, power, uh, uh, connection. Uh, in to items of intrapsychic life and to uh, items of sensory experience. This uh, leads to people, people's internal you know, uh, 
language, internal conversations with themselves, taking on vividness, power, sounding like they're coming from outside, people suddenly realizing with great certainty that things are connected, that none of the rest of us would ever connect. Uh, uh, affect being assigned to routine events uh, that is disproportionate, random, and extremely disruptive. Uh, this uh, dopamine-based positive psychopathology, that, this is the secondary psychopathology, uh, I, I'm sorry, pathophysiology of schizophrenia, uh, and it, uh, it's a chronic biological illness, not any different from hypertension or diabetes. The chronic care model that we use in primary care, uh, let's get this problem into remission by assured treatment and support, and multidisciplinary teams to educate patients and, uh, and their family members. This is what we need to do. Our goal is, uh, is to get this uh, psychosis, this get the dopamine uh, stuff under control, uh, get get sustained remission and keep people from having relapses. Now, again, uh, that's tough in hypertension and it's even tougher uh, in the treatment of schizophrenia because uh, you know the, the organ we're talking to is the organ that has the disease. So we, we, we've got to have even more active multidisciplinary teams uh, working very hard with patients, bringing in family important others to support uh, folks. The, uh, you know, just simple definitions, medical care is that aspect of treatment uh, where we give a person a pill or uh, do something along those lines. Management is how we behave toward the person uh, to, uh, to make sure that they can become active members of the multidisciplinary treatment team, how we engage others to help them. Uh, at that, uh, and how we adapt our interactions with the patient to reflect the fact that they may only be able to memorize or to take and, and keep in their mind half what you'd expect uh, from a, a general population patient could do when we're doing an educational uh, 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 event with them. And therefore, we might need to do more or slightly longer or slightly slow down the pace of educational sessions. Uh, so the treatment, the medical stuff we can do, you know, it's limited to medications that shield dopamine D2 receptors in uh, limbic and striatal structures uh, to reduce positive psychopathology. Um, and that's all it is. When, when you hear people say, I'm going to add this and that and that to affect um, uh, negative psychopathology or cognition, you know, I, I, when I hear that, I, I think I'm, I'm in the presence of the, the creation of entropy because air is being heated and caused to vibrate. But I don't think we can do that. We, we, there's no evidence where we have any capacity to do those things. So focusing on dopamine D2 shields to reduce positive psychopathology, this is basically four questions. You know, am I going to start an antipsychotic med in this person? And if so, which one? Given the frequency of uh, limited insight, uh, acknowledgement of illness and need for treatment in people with schizophrenia, uh, would I be better off to use a long-acting injected preparation? If the first line agent I try is not effective, is it time to give olanzapine? You know, I, I think of as a second line agent offering a little bit more efficacy, but at the cost of uh, the prescriber needing to do a, a bunch more management to heal, handle its side effects. And, and if, if, if I don't get remission of positive psychopathology with, with olanzapine, is it time for me to go to clozapine? So uh, again, I want to stress, we're dealing with people who have, when they are psychotic, really intrusive stuff happening to them, uh, you know, intrapsychic life, uh, sensory experiences jostled and inappropriately valenced, uh, and who have before, during, and after uh, uh, the, any period of psychosis, they have these fixed impairments in cognition, motivation, expression, uh, and, and the grace and fluency of, of movement. 
they, that, you know, we, we can't treat them like we treat a regular member of our family or our friends or colleagues. We have to, we, we have to, we have to deal with these fixed impairments. And again, I will repeatedly suggest that multidisciplinary uh, teams um, are necessary to do this. Uh, the, the concept that a 20 minute uh, visit with a pill pusher every two to three months is adequate for the treatment of schizophrenia, I just think shows a lack of awareness. Now, again, in DSM-5, where, where it talks about uh, schizophrenia, the big focus is on positive psychopathology. Well, you know, I, I think the reasons for that are really simple. When does a psychiatrist see somebody uh, uh, for and make a diagnosis of schizophrenia. It's almost always for the first psychotic episodes and they think in terms of psychosis. In addition, the only uh, treatments available to uh, uh, psychiatrists are uh, dopamine uh, D2 blockers or uh, partial agonists. And uh, you know, it's all about getting the psychosis into remission. The uh, uh, my point is that if you don't fully understand that the primary pathophysiology has been there, you know, since conception, uh, that it will continue to be there uh, as long as the person lives, and that it's a profound determinant of, of, of the patient's function, including function uh, along the lines of, of medication compliance and working with you as a member of the team. If you miss that, uh, you're not going to do a great job with the uh, dopamine uh, blockers or partial agonists. The, uh, uh, again, uh, the primary pathophysiology uh, uh, progresses initially, tends to be relatively stable after the first psychotic episode. Uh, Antipsychotic meds don't affect the uh, primor, primary pathophysiology or the, you know, and, and, and the enduring deficits that are its manifestation. Uh, and what we do with the, uh, with the enduring deficits is, is, is uh, adaptions. Uh, uh, to these fixed deficits in, in such a way that we can, uh, you know, that one of our goals will be to assure they get the dopamine uh, affecting agents uh, reliably. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, folks with schizophrenia do not have, you know, uh, do not have the same brain function as family, friends, colleagues, etc. cetera. Uh, and again, what we do is we modify our expectations and how we interact with them. We, do accommodations, and we'll talk about some prostheses. So <clears throat> let's talk about these fixed deficits. Uh, studies uh, documenting these fixed deficits uh, include uh, studies of the offspring of parents with schizophrenia. There is a Hamid, H-A-M-E-E-D uh, -E -E reference uh, in the uh, in the flyer for this talk, and also, uh, I, I believe, farther in, in in one of the slides, an ab absolutely magnificent paper. I urge you to read it, uh, documenting all of the work, reviewing and summarizing beautifully all of the work, looking at the offspring of parents with schizophrenia, in most cases, the offspring of mothers with schizophrenia, and how even as infants, uh, neonates, they're, they're, they're different or a substantial portion of them are different. Uh, not all of them, certainly. Some grow up to be utterly unaffected by either the deficits or psychosis. Cohort studies that have looked at groups of people uh, over several decades, measured their function, how they were doing, uh, and then, you know, as they're 30, 40, 50, 60 years in, you can identify everyone in that big cohort who you've been measuring uh, thousands of people whose function you've been measuring for you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, who got psychotic, who did not, and then you can go back and look. And again, they document that those who later became psychotic when they were young, infants, youth, first graders were performing at you know, perhaps a third, a half a standard deviation down uh, from their uh, uh, from the from the folks who, who later did not become psychotic, uh, and uh, 
yeah, they, they were different. Of course, we know that by the time people have first episode psychosis, their impairments in cognition are no longer, you know, a third, a half a standard deviation. They're one standard deviation to a one and a half standard deviation down. The, you know, the, the process has accelerated in the lead up to psychosis. Uh, and if we look at, you know, there are spontaneous mutations in which you know, a given patient will develop a, a schizophrenia disorder and no one else in the family anywhere has any of the uh, you know, problems that we're, we're, we're talking about here. But in, in the familial versions of schizophrenia, uh, something in the range of 30 to, uh, to 40% of the first degree relatives will show some aspects of the enduring deficits. Uh, you know, as we know from following the offspring of, of parents with schizophrenia, somewhere around 15% uh, if there's one parent will develop psychosis. It's, it's of course larger than that, around 40% of it's both parents. But uh, many more uh, have other problems and uh, poor developmental uh, and uh, general mental health outcomes uh, over the course of their life and the, uh, lives, and these are these are enduring. Uh, and this list, this slide, and the next will list a, a number of studies that have followed the offspring of a pair of, of a parent or two parents with. Uh, significant uh, psychotic disorder, delayed motor functioning, uh, um, low, slow motor development, uh, problems with uh, motor coordinations, sense, sensory perceptual signs. If you look at cognition, uh, these kinds of studies uh, demonstrate differences uh, uh, in uh, the offspring of parents with schizophrenia in IQ and infancy. Uh, verbal ability, uh, just just um, you know, a, a wide array of, uh, of cognitive function deficits, and not surprisingly, their social behavior is is, is impaired. They're they're less engaged. They're more socially isolated. Uh, they have less motivation. They have less affective control. Um, and then if we move to the prospective cohort studies where this one, you know, this is one of many that have been done, almost, you know, almost 10,000 kids in the Philadelphia area followed with repeated assessments on a regular basis from uh, uh, birth up until uh, several decades along. When you look back at the ones who had some, uh, who developed some psychosis, psychotic disorder over the course of their life, uh, and some of their unaffected siblings there. The, the, these kids had cognitive impairment, odd movements, coordination deficits, poor social ad adjustment compared to the, to, the, to the group of kids who uh, uh, had no psychosis in themselves or their, uh, or their first degree relatives during the decades of follow up. And, and again, this is. Uh, uh, another look at uh, the first degree relatives <coughs> of patients with, with uh, schizophrenia reflecting these uh, cognitive deficits. And, and this gets at one of the points. The cognitive deficits are not focal. There's not like a focal deficit in memory or a focal deficit in spatial functioning. They tend to be very broad and, and, and incomplete. Uh, and uh, one might think of them as, uh, and, and they talk about high executive control demands uh, in them. The more that some overarching distributed neural net is involved in bringing online, holding online, the sub-programs for uh, individual cognitive functions, like if you're doing a memory test, you bring, you bring, uh, recording, storing, bringing back uh, functions online to do that. If you're doing a motor task, you bring those on to do that. Well, uh, you, you get the sense that it, 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 this is a low-grade corruption of complicated 
of management circuitry that is having trouble bringing the right things online, holding them online uh, constantly, not any focal problem with any of these subprograms. Similarly, uh, yeah, and, and the same is true, you know, neurologic soft science basically means none of this is focal, but people are not good at a whole, you know, in, in little ways, uh, in a whole lot of uh, aspects of when you're sensing the world around you and the uh, creating fluent and efficient movements as opposed to clunky uh, movements. On this slide, we also make the point that if you have one of, one of these problems, the cognition, the enduring cognition deficits, the enduring uh, motivation expression deficits, or the neurologic soft signs, you're much more likely than the general population to have at least one of the others. Uh, so you know, many years ago, before there was penicillin, there were descriptions of various types of tertiary syphilis. Well, these were not different dis pathophysiologies. They just had to do with where in this person's brain uh, the infection hit and caused impairment and where in that person the infection hit and caused impairment. The pathophysiology was exactly the same, it was spirochetes. Here, I think it's a, you know, an Occam's razor, let's consider a simple explanation, that the process is the same. It's something that affects the delicate wiring of complex circuits that manage these things, and whether it's a bit more in negative psychopathology, neurologic soft signs, or cognition, is is kind of random and more explained by where 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 it blossomed in the individual patient's brain than anything else. Oh, uh, so again, the uh, uh, these things are there early; they're widespread, not only in the patients but also in a certain number of their first degree relatives. They're overlapping. Uh, they're more, uh, if you have one of them, you're more likely to have others. And, and they're more of a global inefficiency uh, that is picked up better by composite scores than any sub-program or sub, subset score. Okay, uh, you know, as I mentioned, in a subgroup of people who have the primary pathophysiology, Oh, uh, I, I, I would suggest that this same primary pathophysiology reaches and corrupts the, you know, the distributed network that uh, manages the setting of dopamine release into um, limbic uh, and uh, striatal uh, structures that uh, with this loss of management, we get storms squalls of dopamine rolling through these regions that assign salience, trueness, emotional valence. The door opens. Oh, if, is this somebody I know and it's low grade or is it a 800 pound lowland gorilla? A oh, big difference. And if, and if those valencies start getting confused, if, you know, your friend walks in and you perceive him or her as a 800 pound gorilla, you know, it, it, this is going to be difficult. Uh, and connectedness the, uh, is assigned in these areas. That those high tension power lines down the block, the tingling feeling uh, you have in your back. Now I now I understand. I, I see these are connected. So random random effects or uh, random events. Uh, uh, in sensory experience, uh, random events in your intrapsychic life get randomly assigned in, in incorrect valence. Here's the usual picture of dopamine tracts uh, in, in the brain. We see the nigrostriatal tract that ha heads from the substantia uh, nigra into the basal ganglia, and, and it's, sprinkl it's a sprinkler system. You know, tens of thousands of terminal boutons, nothing exact. It's not a, it doesn't individually affect your left index finger or anything like that. It sets the readiness to move. And we know that if that tract dies or we block all its receptors with huge doses of haloperidol, people get an extremely decreased readiness to move and they, they, they have Parkinsonism. Uh, if, on the other hand, we throw too much dopaminergic uh, activity 
in there, uh, in, 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 into that tract, or we let the receptors get super sensitive, we get an increased readiness to move and inappropriate, abnormal, involuntary movements. A chorea, we see the mouth, fingers, you know, all having these, uh, these movements. Well, you know, let's, uh, let's think about uh, uh, increased readiness to do uh, salience assignments. Uh, consider a limbic chorea uh, or a striatal chorea in which instead of abnormal, involuntary, disorganized facial movements or finger movements or whatever, there's uh, a, an increased readiness uh, to assign uh, to random incoming sensory experience or internal life uh, too much valence. Uh, that's psychosis. And, and the evidence that it's a dopaminergic process is, is profound uh, in the really smart people who do these uh, imaging studies, uh, they can show increased uh, striatal uptake of the precursors of dopamine, increased uh, synthesis and storage, uh, and ultimately release uh, uh, occurring at the onset of psychosis. And uh, the degree of the increased dopamine uh, precursor uptake, uh, synth dopamine synthesis and dopamine release is highly correlated, significantly correlated with, with, with the severity of positive features, psychosis. Uh, this is not about negative. This is not about uh, cognition. This is not about movement stuff, you know, in, in, in the sense of neurologic soft signs. This is about psychosis. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, you know, it, it, it's just a simple boil down to hyper-responsive, dysregulated subcortical dopamine systems. You know, fluctuating degrees of dysregulation, pouring storms or squalls of dopamine in, in a random in a random way, uh, gives us somebody with psychosis, and uh, it's it's relative only to positive psychopathology. Uh, its severity and, and the response through use of dopamine antagonists or partial agonists as little shields to cover the. D2 receptors uh, in these in these areas of limbic and association stri uh, striatum. Negative psychopathology, cognitive uh, problems, uh, they're not related. So uh, James Chapman, many years ago in 1966, incredibly gifted and, and, and intuitive guy, uh, was uh, decided to just sit and learn how to talk to people having a first episode of psychosis. And, and he, he immediately recognized that if they were out in an area where there were, uh, uh, where there were random noises, where people were walking by, or if he allowed himself to move too much, to be flipping his tie around, to be you know, waving his hands or blathering too much, these people shut down. They were, they were overwhelmed. Uh, but if he took people to a quiet place, spoke simply and slowly, uh, these people could give him incredible uh, eloquent descriptions of what was happening to them. Uh, he recognized that at times they would stare at him, and he was intuitive enough to realize that by staring at him, they limited all that they saw around them, whereas if they were looking over to, the, you know, here in my house, I if I look to the left, I see my backyard. If I look to the right, I see the street in front of our home. You know, it, it takes, you know, my brain's okay at making that a continuous whole. If you're in the midst of a dopamine storm, that is impossible to negotiate and you, and you just shut down. The uh, lots of visual things, lots of speech things, even in their efforts to do motor function, uh, they had uh, these troubles, but you know the, the vignettes he, he reports in that paper are, are just so heartrending and compelling. Things go too quick for my mind. Everything is too fast for me. Too quick to study. Things get blurred. 
if you if you're seeing one picture one minute and another picture the next i just stop and watch my feet everything i see is split up it's like a photograph graph that's been torn in bits and put back together again if somebody moves or speaks everything i see disappears quickly um, so you know what do we want to do we have these antipsychotic meds our goal of treatment of course is the same as with hypertension we want to get the core feature down in an acceptable range. We don't want the person rolling along at a 180 systolic. We want it to 120 systolic. We add meds until we get it there. It's, it, uh, it may not be perfect, but we get everything down to mild or less, uh, not constantly present, not distressing, not intrusive, and not driving behavior. I, I still firmly believe that the sooner treatment is initiated, after the onset of psychosis or any relapse, the, the, the more rapidly the person reconstitutes and is able to get back to their function. And uh, there's the least problem in terms of slow recovery and incomplete recovery. And of course, as you see a first episode, you know, if you take 100 people with first episode and you get them on uh, dopamine blocking agents, the longer treatment is assured, the more patients achieve remission. And Jeff Lieberman, uh, many years ago, showed that uh, flufenazine decanoate uh, at, at low dose over the course of a year got about 80% of, uh, of the first episode folks he was seeing into the kind of remission I'm talking about. But they might hear a little voice now and then, might you know, the delusions might not be completely gone, but they were able to um, get on a bit with their lives. So, you know, question one, am I going to start an agent? Uh, question one, you know, am I going to start a, uh, uh, an antipsychotic medication? Uh, the more intrusive, the more distress there is, the more uh, things affect their behavior. If there's any self-injury, if there's any aggression violence, not only do you start, but you're you're already thinking, am I going to have to go all the way to close beam with this person? Uh, as I said, I I'm a great believer that the duration of untreated psychosis um, is a predictor of the speed and fullness of remission. So what do I want in, a, in my first line agent? Because I, I like uh, Southwest Airlines. Uh, you know, Southwest Airlines flies only uh, seven, Boeing 737s. Now, except for the problem with the Max 8, this proved to be a phenomenally useful strategy uh, for them. Uh, every, uh, all of their staff became experts at this one airplane. They only had to buy parts for one. And uh, you know the definition of an expert, which is a person who has made every possible mistake in a very narrow area. Well, you know, I want to become an expert with a couple of meds. And, and, and you know, I tried them all, and then I picked. I want something that's once daily dosing and that I don't have to worry about whether it's with food or not with food. I really want something that offers me a long-acting injected uh, preparation because um, you know, many of my patients don't take their pills reliably. I want a benign side effect profile. I'm, it's easier for me to manage extrapyramidal side effects uh, uh, than, uh, than other problems I can... Uh, you know, and lower dose. I, I, I know many of the tricks of that. Uh, taking uh, care of the metabolic abnormalities is 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 more difficult. You're having to add a couple of meds that we don't usually use in psychiatry. People say, "What what, what in the world is that psychiatrist doing, prescribing metformin in this patient who doesn't have diabetes, etc." And I want something that's affordable. My my go to meds right now or a uh, low very low dose haloperidol or uh, 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 aripiprazole uh, uh, you know both of which in the oral form are generic and uh, in, in the long acting form long acting injectable form haloperidol is is is, uh, is generic question two as i've mentioned is you know do i really need to go right to a long acting injectable uh, and that's probably more true in males. It's probably more true in uh, younger folks. 
Uh, if there is a history of impulsivity, a lot of uh, high risk behaviors, uh, comorbid substance use, you know, th th those people are not going to dutifully, conscientiously say, ah, it is time for me to take my pill each night. And you really need to think about an, uh, an LAI. And, and of course, there is the problem uh, that we won't have time enough to do a big discussion on. But, you know, people with uh, schizophrenia, if, if you take the trouble to ask them, uh, they'll tell you they don't think they have any mental problems or really need treatment. Uh, so you get somebody, you get them into remission. Uh, uh, they've been out there for a year. What will every first episode patient and their family say at that point, which is, can I stop the meds? And the problem is that the answer is, oh, you know, you really shouldn't. And if you are going to, please do it not when you've just started a new job or when you've gone away to go to college or when, uh, you know, do it very carefully. Do it at a time when you have people who love you around you. Do it very slowly. Report to me, you know, if you were on uh, 10 of, uh, of aripiprazole uh, a day, let's go to five a day for a month or two. Let's go to two and a half a day for a month or two. And then if you want to stop, that's fine, but I still want you to call me or text me or come in and see me at least once a month. And I want your family and everybody who cares about you to know that this is underway so that if trouble starts, we can get you back on it real fast. Uh, you know, what we know is certainly that in standard care, almost everybody who, uh, including those who have a fantastic uh, recovery from a first episode uh, will stop their meds sometime during the first few years. And I don't know how to stop that. I've, I've, I've told people, you know, it's very dangerous. I've groveled, I've begged, I said, give you a dollar, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and it happens. And I think this is another reason it's really important to have a team, uh, including family and important others in the patient's life uh, to catch these problems early. As I mentioned, uh, insight deficits are common. And, and these are people's beliefs, you know, this is like, you, you, you can't meet somebody who has a different belief about religion or politics than you, and, and just cast that aside as though it, it was meaningless. You have, you have to be respectful of people's beliefs. So I, I start all of my interviews in uh, psychiatry and especially in psychotic disorders with, was it your idea to come to the hospital or clinic? Some people say yes. Oh, uh, and then I say, well, you know, why? And uh, what, are you, what are you hoping to get help for here today? What were you worried about? And sometimes it's, you know, it, it's a person who I know has had some psychotic features for the last several weeks, but their concern is that they can't sleep. You can only work with people in that tiny area where your conceptual framework and their conceptual framework overlaps. And so I might say to that person, you know, I have a really great medicine that'll help you get to sleep here. It's called olanzapine. You take 10 a day um, and you take it at bedtime and you'll, you'll have restful sleep. Oh, if the patient says, no, um, it was not your idea. Well, I say, well, whose idea was it? Uh, well, and, you know, it's often a family member or someone like that. And then I inquire, what were they worried about? Do you think that holds any water? Do you think they have any validity? Again, you know, I mean, people know in the vast majority of cases that their parents, their family, their friends care about them. And, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're often willing to, to work with you on that. And then as we get through that question of how, how you got there today to, cl to the clinic or to the admission in the hospital, I mean, uh, uh, after I get past that, I, 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 I circle around again and, and I say, as you see it, do you have any nervous or mental problems? Uh, as you see it, do you need any treatment for nervous or mental problems? So I, I want to know the belief system of this person. I want to be respectful to it. I want to tell them I may not agree entirely with how you see things and I'll tell you mine and you tell me yours and, 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 and we'll respect each other. But, you know, at some point, there is the issue of, you know, especially if this was a, a person who 
Uh, this stuff's disrupting his life. He had to drop out of school. Uh, uh, he or she became suicidal. There's been aggression. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you really need to, to make sustained meds happen. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it may be time to go to a, a long acting injected uh, measure. The, the, this, this goes through the uh, associations with impaired insight. The impaired insight isn't just a, uh, you know, snobbish opinion or something like that. If you look at what correlates, having more psychosis, having smaller brain, having impaired cognition, having negative psychopathology, these are the things that are associated with less insight, less brain, and it's working badly. So my, I, do I take an absolute respect uh, uh, for the person's wishes when, when they have all sorts of troubles like that with their brain function? Uh, and say, oh, well, in that case, we, we won't even talk about this. No, I don't. I, I really try very hard to get them and bring the family in. And, um, and again, if there's dangerous behavior, you move to involuntary treatment if necessary to, to get them some medicine. One of the things I'm most interested uh, in is that, you know, there have been two excellent studies, one in England, one in Holland, in which patients who were, you know, who, for whom a long-acting injectable was prescribed, but they weren't taking it very regularly, were randomly assigned to either continue in the same program or to each month at the time of their shot, if they came in and got their shot, they were given money. Uh, in England, it was about 15 pounds. In, uh, in Holland, I think it was 15 or 20 euros. Uh, and I, utterly unsurprisingly, adherence with the shots went immediately to 100% or very close to it in the, in the people being given money, didn't change a bit in the other group. Oh, and oh, oh, no, I'm sorry, it didn't go to 100%, but it, 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 it ratcheted up there. Oh, and oh, uh, it, there was no sense whatsoever that patients were suffering from this. And as, as their uh, subjective reported quality of life went on, uh, they, they, they reported improved quality of life. Uh, they, uh, they said everything was fine. Uh, and both studies did follow-ups uh, at, which, uh, at which time the, the, uh, uh, the payment was, uh, was stopped and um, adherence in, in those patients that had improved uh, immediately dropped back to the previous and baseline rate. And I, you know, I've talked about this and I've had people stand up horrified and say, aren't you ashamed of bribing someone to take a medicine they don't feel they, uh, to take a medicine they don't feel they want or need? And I, you know, I say, you know, actually no. And in fact, I'm quite proud of myself. I, I'm, you know, if you take in the overall outcome here, when people really do a lot better on meds. My job is to make sure they're, they're taking the fewest number of meds we can get by with at the lowest doses that we can get by with and with the best control of any possible side effects. That's, that, that's why they let me get involved. Oh, uh, so again, the, it looks like patients and clinicians uh, feel positive about this. And a, a, as I said, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, I tell patients, I wouldn't like to take a medicine that made me feel like crap, and I don't expect you to take a medicine that makes you feel like crap. So I pay a lot of attention to all of these side effects. And, you know, I, I've, patients and I work out ways to manage uh, all of this uh, over time. So, uh, you know, let, let me talk briefly about the, the, the multiple team-based, multidisciplinary team-based interventions for first episode psychosis. Uh, for example, the RAISE program uh, in the U.S. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, largely in the U.S., but I think also in Canada. Uh, the, uh, but the similar studies have been done in Europe, in Asia, in, uh, South America, uh, Australia. Uh, you know, really, and, and, and the findings have been absolutely consistent. It's all based on 
if you go ask patients having a first episode of psychosis, try to get a conversation going, their primary interest isn't in getting to see some old bald guy like me. Their primary interest is in getting back to school, having a social life, living independently. Uh, the same primary interest that everybody in their adolescence and 20s has. Uh, and you know, so it's very important to include in the program an education, uh, employment, uh, social person who you know is there to try to help with all of these things, along with a along with a prescriber, and along with uh, educators who not only talk with the patient but all uh, you know, family, important others who who are going to be part of the prosthetic network. We're, we're, we're replacing functions that are no longer here. Uh, the, you know, if people have trouble remembering, we assign that to you know, one of the family members. If, uh, uh, if people don't initiate activities, <coughs> excuse me, we, we, we get programs going where a band picks them up and, and takes them out to places. Now, a key point I wanna make is that these studies were two years uh, in duration or three years in duration. And when you looked, big differences, uh, big advantages for the team-based intervention on a number of measures, uh, level of psychopathology, compliance with meds, uh, independent living, quality of life, et cetera. Uh, so th th this stuff works. The problem has been that people fail to understand that these are prostheses. These are not curative actions. You have not done brain transplant or gotten rid of an infection or something like that. These are prostheses. And when they followed up uh, the, these wonderful advantages at, at two to three years, when they went to five years, it was a much reduced difference. And by 10 years, these folks were indistinguishable from the people who never uh, were part of the program, so the, uh, you, know, you have to you have to understand this. Uh, the uh, these things really work; they make a big difference. People report being happier. Families report everybody being happier, and uh, you know it, it, this is good work uh, that, that that we're doing out there. But we have to understand uh, <coughs> that they are prostheses. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. We're getting very close to the end. Again, if the first line agent doesn't work, uh, what do we do? For me, I go to olanzapine. Olanzapine has a bunch of uh, troubling side effects, weight gain, uh, and uh, 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 insulin resistance, cholesterol elevations, et cetera. Yeah, you have to either find a colleague in primary care to help you treat or, or learn how to treat yourself. Oh, uh, and I, I am now at the, at, in, my, where, in my life where I preempt. I, if I'm starting olanzapine or clozapine, I, I'm also starting metformin at that point. I may be starting a baby aspirin. I, you know, I'm surely looking at cholesterol, et cetera. Oh, uh, and if olanzapine doesn't do an, a, a good enough job, and especially if there's a lot of self-injury suicide or aggression violence, you know, they, they get in the fast lane to uh, uh, well, close a beam for me, just as very early onset uh, psychotic disorders get in the fast lane to close a beam. Uh, close a beam, uh, even, you know, it, 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 its advantage in terms of control of psychosis is impressive, but even more impressive is the profound effect it has on reducing aggressive aggression and violence. Uh, in patients who continue to have aggression and violence despite all non-clozapine antipsychotics. <clears throat> Olanzapine is a little bit better than the, stand, the rest of them, but uh, clozapine is the go-to drug. And in self-injury and suicide, again, in a beautiful study comparing it to olanzapine, which is a very worthy competitor, uh, clozapine won on every measure. <clears throat> I've mentioned the chronic care model. It's all about treatment, education, engagement. The patient and the family is full uh, team members, decision making. And I'm going to finish up here again with the concept of prosthetics. <clears throat> These most people with schizophrenia, almost all, come to us with 
brain missing. Uh, there, we don't, we are not able to grow that brain back. Uh, and this missing brain used to, or should have been there to do cognitive things, uh, sensory motor things, motivation, expression things that some of these folks can't do. So if we're doing, if we're using prosthetics, uh, a, a long acting injected med uh, to get people assured D2 dopamine blockade, if, we're, you, if we have wonderful, enthusiastic, encouraging activity therapists picking up uh, patients without spontaneous motivation and taking them uh, to the park or uh, to the uh, farmer's market or something like that. If you ask these patients who look kind of blank uh, what it was like, they, they tell you they, they had an absolutely wonderful time. They just can't make themselves do it on their own. You get into transportation, you get into incentives. You know, if you don't want to give people money, uh, suggest to the family that every time the person comes for their long acting injectable, they might want to stop at Starbucks or McDonald's or where, whatever the patient's favorite treat is. And always, and I think all of us do, we've learned, have a really warm, happy, pleasant, lovely injection nurse. So, you know, here is, uh, there's a fellow running uh, with a, prosthesis on to replace his missing leg. Uh, here's a fellow whose arms have uh, been severed uh, and who has uh, prostheses that allow him to play a pretty good game of foosball. But uh, if somebody's been given that prosthetic leg or been given those prosthetic arms, and for the past two or three years, uh, uh, they've really done better, their life has been better, their function way better. Do you then say, oh, well, you don't need that anymore? No, of course we don't. And I think what we have to realize is that these wonderful things we've discovered that we can do uh, for people with these kind of illnesses are things we should do and should continue to do uh, for the length of their lives. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Thank you very much. For those people who'd like to stay around, we have a few minutes. We could have a, a brief discussion. I don't know if Dr. Fon wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, so maybe if it's only a few minutes left, so maybe just uh, stick with the last uh, kind of interesting concept, uh, prosthetics, uh, that everybody can kind of make comments. I think that's a very interesting um, idea and the concept. Uh, what I can think of, like, uh, uh, you know, how to uh, when people lack of insight and how to how to how to kind of remediate that, uh, so I think that Dr. Uh, McVoy kind of uh, um, uh, some 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 of his comments about the, the shared decision making, and uh, I also uh, just shared the uh, the link uh, the uh, sensor on uh, the toolbox uh, that that probably could be part of the uh, related to this concept. Um, I think injectable is another kind of uh, 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 method um, part of it. So I, I will maybe maybe other people can make um, comments on that too. Make one brief comment, uh, Shadow. Um, uh, at the beginning of his talk, Dr. McAvoy mentioned a theory that possibly aberrant sensory connections could explain um, positive symptoms. And um, uh, the theory that he was talking about sounds strikingly familiar to David Baer's sensory limbic hyperconnection hypothesis from the 1970s that would explain these traits that happen in temporal limbic, uh, temporal limbic epilepsy. Baer's idea was that it was the frequent seizures in the limbic system that caused the aberrant sensory limbic hyperconnection and these learned, uh, learned aberrant uh, sensory connections. Um, the thing missing from this theory with schizophrenia is what causes them because the pruning takes place in adolescence, not in early life. So there would need to be, we need to search for another, um, another uh, mechanism that would cause that uh, mm -hmm. hyperconnection. Interesting. Well, I have a one o'clock meeting. Um, so we'll see everybody the first Thursday in January for the next grand rounds. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Happy holidays, everyone.